Welcome to 1001 Ways to Cope with Stress. I am Professor Kinshasa Shabaka, and we are now beginning part three of our exciting tour of the Temple of Luxor in Egypt. And we, our presentation is by Dr. Frederick Munderson, the famous, the um, prolific writer and Egyptologist. I present you Dr. Frederick. Martin. Thank you, Professor, for having me again for this third part. Uh, I wanted to end the second part by, 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 by reinforcing the idea that our study of the Temple of Luxor has, has led us to the belief that the human body is the living synthesis of the essential functions of the universe. Uh, there is that connection. We are tied, uh, uh, as Dr. King would have said, in the mutuality of life and the cosmos. And uh, we have to have a sense of that higher understanding if we are to really uh, have a meaningful contribution for the period in which we are permitted to remain on Earth. So uh, with that, we must remember that in that realization of who we really are, the Africans reminded us, man, know thyself, know thyself, for you are a manifestation of the cosmic experience. Know thyself. So today we want to look at uh, the, what I call the architectural uh, tectronics. What is in the temple? Okay, uh, what do you see? Uh, and when you go there, uh, uh, be prepared to be fascinated, okay? But we must approach this subject with an open mind. We must seek to learn what the past can teach us, not to impose our own concepts on what these ancients did, remember. They were here when we were not. They were the ones who were created out of their own environment, their own material, their own consciousness. So we cannot, in fairness, out of ignorance, of course, say, well, they had this and they did that and they had many gods and we don't understand that. They didn't really have many gods. They clothed the, the one divinity in many manifestations. But uh, for us to understand that, we have to elevate our minds, our spirit, and in that we're elevating our bodies. So, he said that, uh, our scholar, uh, uh, Lovis, said that all pharaonic Egypt, from beginning to end, and in all its achievements, is nothing but a cosmic ritual gesture. That is to say, there is so much being a part of the praise of God, the adoration, because in a way, because God is in us, we are in essence praising ourselves. And when we do this, nothing but good can come out of it. So um, we must uh, come to realize, of course, that once we begin this journey, this part of, of mental and spiritual elevation, we must come to realize that the Temple of Luxor is conceived in the image of a living man. You remember uh, earlier we had discussed the consecration of the baptism of the of the Pharaoh when he goes to the temple and that uh, when he gets up in the morning uh, okay so the sun god is consecrated in the morning when he wakes up uh, he's given his bath by his bath attendants he's fed he's, he's perfumed his rouge and whatever and he's told okay go ahead and do your job cross the heavens in the same way the uh, in the house of the morning when the king is awoken he is given his bath he is dressed, 
he is fed, and then he is encouraged to visit the temple. When he gets to the temple, he is baptized because, I mean, this, this, this whole notion of cleanliness and purity is what this factory is about. And I'm not using the term factory in a, in, in a negative form, but I'm trying to, you know, let you understand that there's work going on here, the spiritual nature and things of this nature. So when he gets to the temple, he has to be baptized again. The temple has to be baptized to open up. The temple is not a coal building that just exists. It is a living entity. So it has to be brought back to life. At night it goes to sleep and what have you. When everything is done, you close up. and uh, But it has to be brought back to life. And the consecration that he, he undergoes is the same consecration. And then the, temp, the, the, the priests go around to the various rooms of the structure. And every image, every writing, every pool, Every, every column, every doorway has to be invoked so that the whole structure comes to life. I mean, it's like the difference between a live body and a dead body. And you see the dead body living there, laying there. And then if it was possible to transform the dead body back to a life, then you'll get an understanding. But you do know the difference between the live body and the dead body. Okay, so the temple is really a living manifestation of divinity, which is a, a, an aspect of humans. So we come to the realization the temple of Luxa is conceived in the image of a living man. The example, as, as I gave, of, uh, of uh, Edfu Temple, where the king will be baptized of consecration and the entire temple must also be consecrated so that it will come to life in all of its constituent parts. Now, what do we have here? We have, first of all, the pylon, which is the entrance, the big entranceway. Uh, uh, the great pylon, Ramses II built that. And uh, he walled the per and he created this peristyle court. Again, a peristyle court is a, 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 a location, an area of columns with no roof. And the opposite of it is the hypersal hall, which is an area of columns with a roof. Okay, so he created this hypersal, this peristyle cord, and he put the, the, the big um, uh, entrance pylon to, as they say, to wall it. And on the outside, uh, symbolism is was a hallmark of Egyptian thought processes. He illustrated two examples of one of the earlier, more famous battles that he was engaged in, which is the Battle of Kadesh. And he's shown on one side of the, uh, of the divide, the east and the west sides of the pylon, he's so shown uh, uh, strategizing, conversing with his generals. And on the other side, he's shown attacking the enemies. And on, so so the, the location of the temple, in essence, then creates two halves or east and west faces of the, the pylon. On the east face, he is seen, he's shown looking to the horizon where the sun will emerge. And on the western side, he is he's seen looking towards the horizon where the sun uh, descends after having traversed the heavens. Uh, the front of the pylon has holes, or we call for what you call flag staves, which uh, from which f the temple flags, state flag, the city flags, all these the god flags will be flown. Mm -hmm. We enter the parasite court where we see double row of smooth shafted columns with blood capitals. We see colossal statues of the king emerging from between the columns. And in the middle, there's an altar. What we do realize is that the temple becomes sacred when it is built from knowledge that includes all points of view, proportions and numbers, axes and orientations,
choice of material, harmony of the figures, the colors, the light, the foundation, the parts, and so on. It is this harmonious synthesis that created the temple, not a vulgar civilization of the sky by the roof or the earth by the floor and other playthings of childish symbolism. We have to understand high, deep science, high science, as my one of my colleagues would say, we have to go deep to understand. Take that. <laughs> So uh, we see uh, the altar that uh, was in the center of the court for ceremonies, the shrine dedicated to the Theban triad, the mosque, mosque of Abu Hagab, the Luxor patron saint. There are two seat, the statues of uh, Ramses II that straddle the center line, the center line often called the Amun axis that goes from the naos in the back of the temple to the kiosk of Hatshepsut, which was dedicated to Abu Mut and his wife Kwansu. Uh, the, the, the mosque, um, it is interesting that everything is oriented towards Karnak Temple, uh, about three miles away. Karnak Temple is the home of the god Abu. Uh, he, he was the sun god. And the temple is oriented from east to west, which is the path that, that the sun traverses. It is interesting that in Karnak Temple itself, all statues in Karnak Temple face the center line. Statues outside of Karnak, instead of facing that temple's center line, they face the Karnak center line. So, uh, with the exception of the statues that were coming out of between the columns, the two seated statues in the peristyle court and the four standing and two seated sta statues on the outside of the great pylon, they all look into Karnak where Amun lived. Again, We talk about the processional colonnade. It is interesting that, uh, let me go back to this, uh, this peristyle court. There is a famous il illustration of the Temple of Luxor with the same in front of the great pylon. There are two seated statues of Ramses II. And there are four standing statues. And beside them, there were two obelisks. So you had two obelisks, two seated statues, and four standing statues in front of the great pylon. There is an illustration in the, the court that shows this same facade. Now, there is a procession of sons of the king. It is called the Ascent of the Princess. They are going to the temple. And this is shown in the illustration. Okay, now following, following the 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 princes are fat cows, and these are part of the uh, uh, sacrificial ceremony that will take here that will take place when they get to the temple. And it's interesting, as I had said earlier, the Nubian lady is shown coming out of the head of one of the cows. Why is this so? Now, it begs a question. Who is this Nubian lady? This god is ha Hathor, is often represented as uh, um, a cow, okay? And she, in the synchronization, in the synchronization, <laughs> she is uh, often she often takes the place of Isis. Okay, so Isis is Hathor in different form, and these are what you would call creation gods or gods who came into being at creation time. So they're old. She was on Norma's palette. Norma is a king who 
United Open Law in Egypt at the beginning of the, and he founded the dynasty. And there was this, this, this document where he is shown on two sides. And the scholar reason that this is the, the, the indication of the unification. She's on the normal palette, which means that technically she is old. At Dirubari, Queen Hatshepsut, again of the 18th dynasty, even before Amenhotep, she built her temple and she built a chapel for this goddess. The English astronomer, Norman Lockyer, in 1894, published his book called The Dawn of Astronomy. And he said that there was a temple to Hathor before 3000. That is even before Narma created his palette. Okay. Now, fast forward to 2011 of our era. And these two writers, Brophy and Boval, wrote this book called Black Genesis. And there is a location in southern Upper Egypt in the Western Desert where people call from a place called Napta Playa. He is saying that these people were the predecessors of the Pharaoh. They were the first scientists. They invent, they mapped the heavens. They had uh, learned how to, uh, they were pastoralists. They were even farmers. But most important, they had begun the worship of the cow goddess. Hathor is a cow. She's often represented as a cow. Why a cow? Because the cow is symbolic of the animal that gives man's sustenance. The milk, the leather, uh, the meats, and everything else. And it's a prime part of any kind of sacrificial experience that all religions practice. But guess what? This is not discussed in the books, which is a part of the systematic exclusion in the form of distortion and omission to prevent and give credit to African people as being the earliest minds who created not simply this temple, but the science, the mathematics, the geometry, the philosophy, the metaphysics, the spirituality that undergird all of this. We were there in the beginning. When God first made man in his image, he made the African. But he said to the Africans, be careful. People will steal your birthright, guard it, and work to bring good to the world. And okay. that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> okay, so so we come again to that famous court of Amenhotep, the, 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 the third uh, I mean, the, the, the place where is the photographer's paradise, okay? Uh, we have the double row of, 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 of 16 columns, which is 48, uh, 12 columns, which is 48, and then eight, 64 columns in there, which lead us into the hypercell hall and into the back where uh, the god was often worshipped. Uh, the hypercell hall. I was really, uh, I was really intrigued when I saw your your decoration for the table, because I had covered that in. Um, I found in a book called uh, "The Columns of Egypt" two thousand two by J. Peter Phillips, where he looks at all the columns of this particular court, mm -hmm. and he says that they show lily and papyrus decorations symbolic of Upper and Lower Egypt, the, uh, straddling the Nile. Your blue, your your white, your 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 uh, forms. The lower part of the shafts of the columns of the south of the courtyard are decorated with lily reliefs, and those of the north with papyrus reliefs. The decoration changes at the nominal east-west courtyard. To complicate matters, the columns of the east show uh, depictions of the the red birds, whereas those of the west are decorated with royal cartridges. And we go into the uh, uh, the Hypercell Hall and the Sanctuary. What we have not talked about, 
is the open air museum. Okay, once you get to the end of the, uh, this is what I was saying about these people who one minute and 30 seconds later were, were exiting the temple. They didn't know about the, the, the open air museum. The open air museum has thousands of broken stone. Each one principally has some kind of illustrated image. So, uh, but what it does indicate is that the temple was attacked often because invading forces, one of the first thing they do is what? They try to, uh, to desecrate the god who worship in the temple. And secondly, they try to get the riches that is part of the treasury. So the open air museum, which is much different to the open air museum at Karnak. Karnak Temple has all of these stones that were, that were resurrected in the excavation, but here you have them arranged uh, sequentially, chronologically, right? But there's so much of it that it shows that there was a vendetta committed against the temple that most people one, they don't have the time to, uh, to investigate it or even know about its existence. I wanted to bring that to your attention. And outside of the temple, outside of the temple, beyond the great pylon, one of the 26th dynasty pharaohs, Nectanebo, he added uh, this court. Again, it's tremendous expansion beyond the temple itself. And then there was what is called a Sphinx Road, linking Luxor Temple with the two principal temples, Karnak and Mut, to the north, some three uh, miles away. And this is, uh, uh, it brings us to uh, an understanding of, again, what is the purpose of Luxor Temple? beyond the celebration of the festival of the God. It is an awareness, the creation of awareness of man's intimacy, man's relationship to the divine powers. Man realizing that he is a part of the work of God. In many respects, he is God in human form, not as a form of, uh, by saying that, it's not a form of blasphemy, but it is an attempt to elevate man to a consciousness where he realizes who he is and what his mission, his destiny should be. His destiny is encompassed in the survivability of the cosmos. If the cosmos fails, if man fails, if we look at if we look at uh, one of the planets uh, on the uh, in the solar system, Mars, for example, Mars is nothing but a, a barren piece of real estate. If it's worth that, it must have some value. But there is no life. There is no man. So if if we can presuppose that man, if as we know him existed on Mars, and he no longer exists on Mars, and Mars is now a barren piece of property, real estate, land, mass, then Earth, devoid of man, becomes a second uh, Mars, right? So this temple represents man's conscious understanding and is striving to be godlike in terms of, again, as I was saying, not blasphemy in any respect, but a realization that we could do a whole lot better than we are doing. And have a responsibility to. Uh, of course, right? In terms of the elevation of the mind, mm -hmm. the, the, the acquisition of knowledge, Acquisition of knowledge dictate that you act in a certain manner, not out of ignorance, but out of a uh, conscious realization that uh, people ought to be 
at least treat it as equals. Uh, I mean, in a more mundane explanation, uh, uh, the, 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 some religions prize the whole notion of giving alms, giving to the destitute, helping your fellow man. Don't look down on him, pick him up. Uh, so all of this is a part of uh, uh, purpose in life. Why are we here? And this is what these Africans were able to realize at a very early time in their experience. The temple, this, the, 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 the workmanship, the creativity, the type of stone material used to build the, 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 the architect striving for perfection, to be exact, to create the house that you know, the story is told of um, um, he found the Tuskegee, uh, what was his name? Uh, Washington. <laughs> Booker T. Washington. As a young man, he went to, 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 um, to the college and he wanted to get a job. He wanted to get an education. And uh, the guy put him in a room. Uh, and, uh, he cleaned the room about six or seven times. And when the man came and he went here and he went there looking for dust, he couldn't find it. So the whole idea again of Luxor and so much more of this God experience, this philosophic spiritual transformation that man is uh, supposed to experience is about elevation of the mind, the body, and spirit.